So I think the impetus for this conversation comes from um, a lot of interest we've gotten from students and from attendees at Earth Institute events around what climate communication should look like and, and what it means, particularly in the wake of the COVID pandemic. I think some of the people who attend Earth, Earth Institute events have identified kind of this public burgeoning mistrust around science in certain spaces. And I think there's been a natural question around how climate communicators on a day-to-day -day basis operate to really communicate the message of the crisis. And, you know, even at a more localized scale, how day-to-day -day people can engage in climate communication and talk to the people in their life about the issue in a way that's productive and effective. And I think the first thing I'd love to ask you, and this is kind of a big question to ask, but as a climate communicator, do you have something that you're trying to accomplish or something that kind of sits in the back of your brain that you consider to be the goal of what you're setting out to do? Well, that's a great question because that should be every communicator's first question. What do you want to get done? Uh, yeah. Is it learning? Is it is it a is it change in the world? Um, my thinking has evolved a lot on this question since I started in the '80s on writing about climate change, and um, I think my traditional old approach to climate change was that it was a pollution problem. You know, we're emitting gases; they trap heat, it's changing the climate. So it's very mechanistic and sciency. Mm -hmm. And I communicated about it by talking to climate scientists. And, you know, I, you've probably seen, I um, did my first cover story in 1988. So that's a long time ago. That was the same year it became a story, really. Uh, yeah. And, uh, testified it, taught, and uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel, was formed. Mm. So my conception of this was, and of course, that came after a bunch of environmental issues became stories. Acid rain, deforestation. Even the ozone hole, the ozone hole, most proximally to climate. A new, and they all were like a story with a problem and a solution. Right. So I just latched, I and many other journalists latched onto the climate story the same way. And it only became clear like 15 years in that this was much more complicated. It wasn't just a pollution problem hmm. that our, 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 our desire for energy our, our norms of human behavior and, and all of our institutions were uh, about the near and the now. You know, we have some treaties that are global, but um, m many of them don't work very well, the global treaties. The United States has still not even ratified the, uh, the ocean one. So um, I started to evolve a more multidimensional idea of what this mm -hmm. climate story is. And that's changed everything. Uh, it, it creates a sense of um, opportunity especially if you look at it from the lens of risk. And just think about Ida, you know, who drowned in basements? It wasn't you and me, thank, thank God, you know, it wasn't, it, it was people who had no other choice for housing because right. they're marginal, they're newcomers to the city, they're poor. There were some exceptions, you know, some of the deaths were in cars of people commuting and not driving into deep rushing water, which is, we're not going to blame them for being, you know, doing something that really was ill-advised, but let's focus on the housing thing. So is the story there about climate change or is it about climate vulnerability hmm. and risk? And when you flip it that way, suddenly everything crystallizes. Even this, the, what we call climate justice now is really imbalanced risk. Climate justice is, exists as a, as a field, as a rallying cry now, because black and marginalized communities of uh, immigrants, uh, especially in the case of the basement apartments, is mostly immigrants, yeah. many Asian, they don't have an opportunity for safe housing. Um, and we could, even with success on climate change, there's any, any chance that New York gets hit by extreme rains a lot, not, mm -hmm. you know, uh, climate change is, is changing rain patterns, but not so much. Um, there are, you go back in history, there are gully washers, uh, galore. And, uh, you know, so those, that vulnerability can be reduced right now, right? It's right. a much more discreet story than solving the climate crisis, but yeah. it's also more, more actionable. So, so to me, uh, what happened was I parsed this out now in ways that I didn't in the old days. And I think a lot of what you're speaking to there is also true for the kind of changing salience of the climate crisis itself, where it was this scientific kind of 
existential far off thing. And I feel like in a policy world as well, um, there's just been this shift to kind of looking at it from a more intersectional lens. And I think a lot of the coverage on the climate crisis has evolved in a similar way where it's no longer just about the details of the science, but how that science is impacting people. I'm curious um, in terms of the way that climate communication has evolved since you mentioned, you know, the eighties, you know, what, what did like, does the audience change in that as well? Does the like purpose or the people you're trying to speak to, does that evolve as, you know, the understanding, the public understanding of climate change increases? That's a great question. Um, there's several pieces to it. Um, I think one of the frustrations of those who've been latched onto a story like this for so long is that it's hard for to get attention. To, well, there's a couple of things. It's hard to get attention to something that's incremental and where even with the impacts we see now, the worst impacts are in the future. The newsroom right. norm is what happened today. The page sure. one meetings at the New York Times, you know, which I sat in on sometimes when I was at the New York Times, your story on a new paper in, in the journal Science on Greenland ice sheet instability is competing against Afghanistan and the stock market and yeah. politics. And that always gets discounted because it's complicated and it's well, didn't we already write about Greenland? I kind of I think I've had that <laughs> conversation. It, it's still melting, it's melting faster. Okay, is that a front page story? So right. there's that part. Um, and then there, the, there is that, um, there's a kind of a ghettoization of science journalism too, which I think is what you might be implying it's changed. I, I think it's getting a little bit out of that niche of being an environment story. Um, and it's infusing itself into other coverage, uh, other issues as, as we were just mm -hmm. talking about. There, I think the more that we can liberate the story from being talked about by climate scientists, for example, the better. Even though I'm surrounded by climate scientists at, at the climate school and at your sure. institute. And, and many of them care deeply about the social issues. And, but the social scientists, behavioral scientists, historians of, of, uh, who dig in on you know, why, why redlining patterns in New York City from the 30s, in many cities across the country, that constrained where black families could settle. Mm. Why that now leads to outsized heat vulnerability for communities of color or flooding, et cetera. Um, and that takes it away from being the grand climate crisis story, again, toward being actionable. You know, these are things, once you identify that a city has a very uneven landscape of vulnerability to heat, that gives you a huge number of opportunities going forward that don't rely on the UN or, right. or even the Paris Agreement. You know, I think one of the most valuable um, revelations I, I, that came to me after sort of halfway through my journey on this is that um, we shouldn't be waiting for some grand top-down agreement hmm. to solve the climate crisis. Um, I learned through a lot of hard reporting that the treaty process essentially enshrines what's possible. I've, I've yet to see evidence that the treaty process is determining what's possible in terms of climate. Mm. You know, you look carefully at the data, the Center for the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia and others on en energy use and stuff, you know, um, you don't see um, a blip in global energy uh, use uh, in the context of there having been a framework convention in 1992 or, you know, the Paris Accords now. It, yeah. It, it's even, you know, there's a lot of talk of an energy transition that hasn't really happened. It, it's mostly, as my energy wonk friends sadly say, it's mostly energy addition so far. <laughs> yeah. It's like we've, pa we've painted a solar and wind and water frosting layer on a big fossil fuel cake. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you look at the graphs. That's exactly what it yeah. looks like. It's like yeah, with two hundred years of fossil fuels going like this, and then you have this. Little, oh, look at there's there's solar. This wind. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I guess I'll just say that's a third lens on this question. You know, the climate crisis. Yes, global warming is happening. 
we'll have centuries, if not millennia, of change in the climate and the rising seas. We can modulate that for sure. Um, and we have these social realities, which are driving vulnerability. You know, who gets hurt in a, in a storm? Right. And then the energy side is another big chunk of the story. And there too, the story is about the battle between sort of energy access. You know, we still live in a planet like India still has about 300 million people. That's the size of the American population with no electricity. Yeah. And uh, when John Kerry goes over there and finger wags and says, you need to use less coal. Like, okay. India is correct in saying, well, okay, what are you going to do to help us? <laughs> Right. We, we, you know, we're way India has a two ton per person per year carbon uh, output. We have a 17 ton per person per year uh, carbon uh, footprint here. Europe is about right. six. So any idea that everyone needs to step forward uh, without a substantial boost in our, you know, investment in, in helping an energy transition in poor countries is is fantasizing so those are all parts of the climate story they're not all about exxon they're not all about you know, you know if we just stifle these dissemblers and liars and sue the hell out of them we're going to de decarbonize i would love to think it's that simple but right it's not um and i think so i don't want to ramble on but but i i think what that does is it reveals a whole bunch of storylines yeah, and I feel like so, like what you were just doing, even in that response, was taking what is a very complicated and, I guess, just like interwoven fabric of this issue and breaking it into bite-sized pieces. And that actually leads to a question I had almost more on a process standpoint, that as you're dealing with climate scientists, as you're talking about energy mixes or international treaties, as a climate communicator, how do you take these things that are oftentimes not really on people's radar, a little bit more technical or wonky than people might be familiar with, and turn it into something that is digestible and that feels relevant to a reader, or to an audience member. Well, the relevance has to come first and the digestibility is mm. a function of, are they you know, vegetarian or knowing what they like <laughs> to eat? Um, so, so um, and there, this gets to one of the other thing that really shapes what I've been doing the last few years, mm. including especially here at Columbia, um, I could have done a lot more writing than I have the last two years, but I focused on building these conversation spaces, the sustain what webcasts that yeah. I do and some internal webinars. I've done like 220 of those since COVID struck. Wow. And they've engaged with a, a million or so people, some, you know, for a fraction of a second, some for deep engagement. They're very much about convening a, a diverse array of people. Uh, on a, on one of these little subset questions and driving mm -hmm. forward a conversation in, in in my dreams i i would like to see this become a normalized kind of a f form of medium you, you know podcasts yeah. are sort of like this but most podcasts are um distinct from what i've been trying to do they're they're episodic and i shouldn't you know there's some great ones. Uh, the podcasts that I like are, are exploratory, hmm. where the, there's not a preconceived story arc, right? Because these Let's issues are not simple, you know. And that that's I think, like I've had sessions. I had Joel Cohen, who's a great Columbia. He has joint appointments at Columbia and Rockefeller University, and he's one of the world's leading population experts hmm. uh, for decades and decades. He wrote the book "How Many People Can the World the Earth Support." Oh, I've read that book. Yep. Yeah, and the answer was it depends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, cliffhanger. So I had he had done some fresh work, and rather than just having him on, I had on um, Katindi Sibi, who's a futurist in Nairobi, who's trying to build a um, foresight lab so kids and uh, young people in Nairobi can develop the capacity to uh, for for long term planning in in a country that's struggling just to deal with today's problems, let alone the, the tomorrow. And it was much richer conversation having Katindi and, and Joel in the same room. Mm. And there was one other guy who's sort of a technologist. And, and and I'd love to think we can revisit that. My 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 approach to these complex questions is in shifting away from storytelling, you know, this kind of stuff, neat, clean, <laughs> beginning, middle, end reported stories to yeah. shaping conversations with some outcome. And what mm. emerged in the one with Joel and with Katindi was 
what can I do to help foster her capacity to create a force, foresight lab in Nairobi for African youth? And I'm overdue to circle back to that one. It, but And that's like, so that's climate communication. Yeah. Well, sustainability communication. That isn't telling a story. It's it's getting some brains into a place and having them do think about something they might not think about otherwise and perhaps collaborate on something that together they can do more effectively than they could alone. That reminds me, I had the opportunity to um, speak with Dr. Kate Marvel a little bit about how she thinks through climate communication. And one of the points that really struck me that she made in that conversation was that climate communication, maybe at a certain point in time, was a little bit more about climate scientists coming in, projecting the thing, and then kind of leaving the space. And there's your information, there's your facts, your statistics. And she was really encouraging. And I think a lot of what she's trying to foster is similar to what you're describing, where it's about these kinds of human connection spaces where we can actually bring our emotions into this space, where you can connect with diverse people on diverse ideas and not necessarily have a particular motive in mind, not really come away trying to change someone else's mind, but more so meet in an open space and just air out where you might be able to connect and engage and dive a little bit deeper on the issue of climate change. Totally. And the, and one of the things you do in, in a good conversation, ideally, is a lot of listening. And my friends uh, and colleagues like Peter Coleman, who runs the uh, Difficult Conversations Laboratory at Columbia and wrote a book on how to get beyond polarization. You know, there are methods yeah. for this. There's this practices almost like um, meditation or calisthenics. You know, there's ways to approach a conversation that can foster the kinds of cross thinking that you're talking, you just described too often you're in it, we, you call it a conversation, but you're really just waiting to make your next point. Yeah. You're looking for your entry point or, and that's not active listening. Um, and there are so many examples I've seen over the years where, as you said, with a little space, with um, an open approach, you can find areas of uh, convergence in people who would deeply diverge if you led the conversation in a different direction. Right. I just uh, I was on a, a call this morning with folks from Bank of, Bank of America and uh, someone who runs a uh, sustainability um, and mindfulness enterprise. And we were talking, you know, when you're in a bank, you're dealing with lots of people who would be climate skeptic or you know, focused on money more than these issues. And mm. and I brought up an example of um, a, a great journalist, uh, John Sutter, was in Oklahoma reporting on the climate question a few years ago. And among the people he talked to were this oil guy, an oil worker, like an executive level oil uh, employee, who who early in the conversation, he's saying, you know, God controls the environment. And you're thinking, oh, boy. We're not going to get very far. And then when he asked him about energy, he said, you know, we have half of our roof covered in solar panels and we're going to try to get off the grid entirely. Mm. So the guy, basically he's libertarian. He doesn't want government telling him what to do. He doesn't want a utility taking his money if he can generate sure. electricity himself. Sure. Right? <laughs> so his, ind his independence streak which would guarantee, this was 2015 before mm. the uh, Trump election. I guarantee you this guy uh, would not have voted for, well, that was Hillary. They run up to Hi Hillary in 2016. Wow. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> Lots happened since yes, then. Right. The world's so anyway, a little different now. <laughs> you, know, you know this guy would not have voted for Hillary Clinton. And that if so, if you and you know he's not going to buy into like the climate crisis that you and mm -hmm. I think about. But by listening first, by going into Woodward, Oklahoma, and looking around and talking, you know, then say, wow, this he's getting off the grid. That's cool. I can live with that. You know, I don't really. Yeah. You're, if, I can set aside my divergence with you on some things if if we can talk about energy policy as it relates to solar panel ac uh, accessibility. Great. And those are all around, they're all around. Um, no one, like for example, on the climate vulnerability side, mm -hmm. you know, no one wants to, I don't know anyone, Republican, Democrat or whatever, who wants to be vulnerable to climate hazards, first of sure. all. Right? So focusing on reducing climate vulnerability 
what can we do as a community to make sure that our opportunities and uh, risks are, uh, you know, for our neighbors as well are, as ourselves are, are the, the, the risks are limited. You can get lots of evangelical conservatives dug in on that uh, before you. And by the way, another area demonstrably where this is true is in subsidized, like subsidized flood insurance. There are libertarians mm. who hate the idea that we're subsidizing self-destruction by right. allowing people to build in areas that, that are known to flood, not, not just the flash floods like we had, but just garden variety storm flooding. Yeah, absolutely. And that actually resulted in legislation um, in 2011-ish, the Bigger Waters Bill, which was hmm. trying to raise the cost of flood insurance. Republicans and Democrats agreed. They signed it. Obama, I mean, Obama signed it. And then there is, this is not like some happy, simple story because <laughs> what happened is as flood, flood insurance rates rose too fast. And so Democratic and Republican homeowners said, what the hell is going on here? We, we can't afford to live in our house anymore. So right. even though the, the idea of rational pricing for, to, to foster managed retreat, as we call it, you know, at Columbia, mm -hmm. uh, that it makes sense, a lot, a lot of sense, but it, it's not an easy win either. Not at all. But it just shows you, it just shows you again that through careful, strategic uh, conversation and discourse, you can get progress in big chunks of this problem. Yeah. And I feel like with the climate crisis in particular, so much of its origin story is in division, is in this kind of fanning the flames of who believes in it and who doesn't and having scientists and people who don't get along with scientists and kind of trying to create this drama around the issue itself. And I feel like what you're describing and, and also what I've seen, what I'd like to think I've seen in the last few years is more so finding ways to bring people to the table a little bit more proactively, not necessarily to win an argument, but more so just to have the start of a conversation um, that might then lead to subsequent right. conversations, not with any particular outcome in mind. Right. And, uh, you know, this can feel dispiriting to those who are pursuing a, a dream, for example, of solving the climate crisis. Right. And this gets to one of the other fundamental learnings that, that came to me after you know, 30, 33 years of this, is um, there's some issues that transcend our normal sense of problem, solvable problems. Uh, and, and the way I characterize this sometimes is to point to the war on poverty, uh, the war on drugs, mm -hmm. the war on cancer. You know, we use those phrases um, as if we're going to win a war. Uh, the people yeah. who are deeply dug in on cancer and poverty, and, and not to mention the war on um, the war for um, true equality. You know, these are tough, deeply embedded, historically embedded um, challenges that just are not in that sort of win lose mode. Yeah, and that that's where sh uh, I think the value lies in shifting from storytelling toward toward uh, dialogue enabling, because that can spread. You know, one person to another through social media. The upside of social media, uh, there's a downside, big one, huge one. You can start to to build uh, ground swells on things like uh, uh, reducing energy waste. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's technologies we have now to trace uh, supply chains for the materials and stuff we rely on. So you, um, we know which restaurants are serving uh, some illegally harvested fish. Uh, there's DNA testing that local groups have done, even schools have done to uh, reveal what's actually in, in the wow. restaurant menu. Uh, there, there was this, one of the stories I love was West Virginia University had a little tiny program where they they were testing car emissions and they were testing the uh, Volkswagen diesels. Mm -hmm. And it was that work that revealed the whole Volkswagen deception with their uh, dirty diesels that were oh, no being way. touted as clean. It was a tiny, like a hundred thousand dollar grant to an engineering lab at West Virginia <laughs> university. And that, un, you know, unraveled into a multi-billion dollar settlement against Volkswagen. It, so there's a superb potential now to, to do small scale things that can really reverberate and, and spread. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, so that's part of the story going forward is spreading that capacity. And it's different than telling another good story. Right. I'm wondering, um, 
something that I come up against as someone who's still relatively new in the climate space is kind of grappling with the sense that incremental progress is valid and important in its own right, because as you said, you can't solve it all and you can't fix it all. And in a way it's liberating, I think, to know that as one person, no one person has the answer. And at the same time, it can feel really hard and difficult. And I'm curious within your career over the last 30 years or so, how have you kind of worked against that feeling of burning out or that feeling that this issue is so big and I can only cover so much of it? What's your antidote to that? Assuming that's something you've encountered, maybe you haven't. Oh God, yes. <laughs> and, and not just climate, you know, I've written, I've, I've written the equivalent of obituaries for several species that okay. have gone extinct in the time I've been a journalist. Uh, the Baiji, the river dolphin in China, uh, a colobus monkey that actually got rediscovered still rare. Really? The, oh my um, gosh. It's the red col the Miss Waldron's red colobus. I wrote a New York Times story when it was declared extinct and then they found it. <laughs> so, and by the way, which is one of my sources of hope, nature is incredibly um, adept at, at um, foxing our, our um, efforts to tamp it down. And Do you issue a, a redaction of the obituary at that point? Like from a- I, You know, I'd have to look back. I, I, yeah. I don't know what we did. It was much later, it was years later. Um, so, uh, by getting to the core of your, your question, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I tend to, first of all, part of this is just your own demeanor. I tend to wake up kind of gung-ho. I tend to go to bed kind of bummed out. <laughs> yeah, and I can for some reason or other, I, <laughs> Yeah, for some reason or other, I tend to wake up the next morning gung-ho. Not always. And, you know, I go for a walk in the woods and, and uh, that helps too. Um, but I guess... My victory, my sense of victory comes from keeping track of the positives along with the negatives. Our, our news mm -hmm. cycle, our the lens we have on the world right now, is still even with Yes Magazine and Up This, and is still mostly the downside of things. Um, and just think a week ago, as Hurricane Ida's remnants were hitting New York City and the, the environments here. The World uh, Health, the World uh, Meteorological Organization issued a 50-year report on on climate-related disasters, and the the losses, the financial losses, have gone up greatly, largely because we built a lot more stuff in places we shouldn't. Hmm. The death rate has gone down dramatically. So even as from 1970 to now, the let's see, the human population went from doubled essentially, but the rate, the number of deaths has declined. So those background numbers are very hopeful. Bangladesh yeah. alone, 1970, they were hammered by a horrific um, cyclone, had several hundred thousand deaths. And they've been hit by similar storms since, but they have developed great capacity at early warning. Some people at Columbia at um, IRI work with them to foster even better uh, cyclone response and the like. There's tremendous progress that's been made. And that excites me too. It's not even, It's they're still, as long as there are people dying in heat waves, when scientists say no one should die in a heat wave, no, no one yeah. should have to die in a heat wave. That if you know where they are, and like in Portland, a big chunk of the deaths in Portland, that Portland area heat wave were in uh, elderly people in, in unair conditioned um, um, apartments and uh, mm -hmm. mobile homes. A mobile home is like a, you know, like a toaster oven. And, uh, if we had, if people, if communities had known, oh, you know, someone should check on Charlie. Yeah. That goes a long way toward cutting those risks. And, and that's, so there's always more work to be done. And so those things every day, and also on the energy front and, uh, you know, people at like Columbia, like Julio Friedman working even on the frontiers of things like capturing carbon, which, you know, we have to stop producing more carbon along with catching it. Um, uh, there's their advances every day that make me, not despair about where we're going. I think mm. there's really high chances at the end of the century, we can have a prospering human society on a still vibrant planet yeah. without runaway climate change. There's a Let's, lot of ifs, but it's totally doable. I wanna pick up on something that you mentioned in that response where climate coverage can sometimes feel more doomsday or oftentimes we read about the problems and the loss of life or the damage. And I'm curious, um, you know, what is the balance, I guess, of conveying the severity of what's happening because of climate change impacts while also still 
creating space for the solutions that exist and trying to, you know, incentivize action. There's a lot of tension in that question. It's a really good one. Um, you know, I have close friends who drive the urgency side mm -hmm. every day in hopes that it will connect with people sufficiently to nudge them to vote differently or, um, and the balance there is unless they have options that, that are to take that urgency or worry or that sense of fear and run with it and do something with it, then a lot of that ends up producing more paralysis than actual outcomes. Yeah. The other problem is our political system is so damaged this past decade or so. I did a recent webcast with Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island, my home state, mm. and a couple of Columbia students. And, you know, he, he takes it back to basic structural problems here. You know, he, he uh, Senator Whitehouse points to um, Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that said companies are essentially citizens and they have limitless power to spend money on advertising. Yeah. You know, that that's not a climate, that goes way beyond climate problem. And that can be, that's more dispiriting than the climate problem itself, I think, that our, our democratic system in the United States is, is um, damaged right now. Mm -hmm. That too leads to the need for work. Um, and if you have that system become more functional, then that can lead to more rational outcomes on things like global warming. Right. I kind of drifted from your question, but I think part of what I'm saying is the if if you want to convey the grandness of this problem, it's important to be radical in the most fundamental nature of the word radical. Um, there, there was a Brazilian environmentalist who became Brazil's environment minister when I was there writing a book a very long time ago. Uh, Jose Lutzenberger, Jose, and he said, uh, he goes radical. The the Latin root of the word radical is the to the to the, the to the root. <laughs> it's yeah. to be to go to the root of the problem. And so, if the climate problem is fundamentally about the structure of American politics, then yeah. that's where the work needs to be done. And, and arguably, where some of the communication needs to be done too. Yeah. And and and, and yet at the same time. We also have to be un to understand what aspects of this problem are beyond politics, and that's hmm. the the energy realities in the world right now are still that. You know, if you're in an unelectrified part of India, and you're cooking on firewood or dung, and your household is losing years of life because of the insane pollution levels, which make the wildfire pollution look mild. Yeah, and that's that's indoor pollution. Um, you know, you want a better life. You want a better prospect for your kids. Most everything you want is related to having energy access. And that that can be more than enough of a story for someone to latch on to mm -hmm. and pursue for the rest of, of, of a life or, or a career. Where do you see, um, like we've spoken a little bit, I guess, about how climate communication has really evolved over the last few decades. I'm wondering, where do you see it going, both with the change in mediums and also in the way that people are showing up for the climate crisis and weren't before? What's the future, I guess, of climate communication? Huh. It's, uh, well, you can see the upside of social media and global connectivity is Fridays for Future and the other youth and student-led projects because you, you know bill mckibben when he was launching 350 could it be as long as 15 years ago something like that you know the internet was there but social media was not really there yet and they were able to build a pretty good effective uh, global uh, enterprise uh, focused on slowing climate change um but now you know the coordination and idea trading among young people is fantastic uh even with the uh the swarms of uh, TikTokers are swarming. Uh, I can't even keep track of which, 
<laughs> platforms where, where oh, no, it's not TikTokers. It's the um, K-pop swarms, uh, you know, kind, kind of overloading the, uh, the social platforms of the people who are not being uh, Oh, right at the, yeah. At the <laughs> That there, there's lots of stuff that can be done now at the global scale that was inconceivable a few years ago. Mm. The, the, um, as I said, the capacity to ground truth what industry is doing, the capacity to understand the uh, long distance impacts of the stuff that that we rely on, uh, the global supply chains, is amazing. Um, yeah. The, uh, uh, what was the root of the question again? Just get back to like. Yeah, I guess just I'm curious how you see climate communication evolving moving forward. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, an example is uh, Dan Hammer, who young kind of technologist and he does many things. He was in the Obama White House in technology. Mm. He runs something called uh, earthrise.media. And it was initially a way for to get journalists uh, rapid response satellite imagery to help with stories, not just climate stories, but like when China was building those islands in the South China Sea, they could quickly get images of it. The kind of stuff that the CIA used to be the only purveyor in. Um, he now has this initiative that I ran a Columbia webcast on early last year where students in um, middle schools the initial cohorts were in Massachusetts and Iowa, were sifting satellite data, satellite images from the Amazon, and they they helped to identify areas where there was illegal uh, intrusions into Yanomami Indian Reserve. And then that work got conveyed to Reuters, the news agency, and they wrote a big package on this, a very impactful story. Yeah. And that put pressure on Brazil to crack down on the illegal uh, mining activity. Wow. So that says, the more of that, the better. Um, yeah. There are NGOs using satellite imagery to track um, coal-fired power plant activity. Uh, China, we used to have to rely on China government to provide the data on its use of coal and stuff. And you can see their numbers seem to have gotten more um, accurate lately hmm. because they know they can't cheat anymore. Uh, satellites can keep track of how big the pile of coal is next to a coal-fired power plant. They, they know when it's operating, when it's not operating. So you can start to have an independent picture of global um, uh, production of emissions. There's the uh, M methane satellite that uh, Environmental Defense Fund has launched or is launching. I mean, the idea that an uh, that a nonprofit environmental group could have a satellite, yeah, was mind blowing. <laughs> you know, the early days yeah. of the space race. When I, so that 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 stuff is all incredibly exciting to me, and and I think leads us. To the prospect of again better outcomes. Hmm. I I have one last question. I know I've um, taken enough of your time, but I'm curious for people who want to be stronger climate communicators, whether that's at the dinner table with their family, or at their school, or at their workplace, or at a larger level. What advice do you have? I mean, do you do you have words of wisdom where they can start? Um, resources they should consider to be able to talk about this issue in a way that feels more productive and more fruitful? Well, it's good that you mentioned the dinner table and like um, the, the first step is talking about it. Yeah. Including talking about your uncertainties or concerns, you know, engaging across generations can be challenging. You know, if your parents are older and this is no different than when I was young and we were watching the Vietnam War footage on the evening news and my dad and I would argue about Nixon. Hmm. You know, someone today arguing with a parent about climate change is not that different than these, these some of these are just generational. But that's where that that listening part comes in again too. Um, well where does our energy come from? How much of our energy in our community is is uh, fossil? Uh, can we where we live join a, a collective uh, right here in the Hudson River Valley where I live in or Lenape land up here in the Hudson Valley, there are community choice aggregation options where communities can band together and buy renewable power from the grid. But you have to know it's possible. Yeah. So asking those basic questions at community meetings and uh, what can we do differently? Can we do a carbon audit? Can we at least get an understanding how much of our 
our contribution to climate change here is from commuting versus from uh, heating and cooling our old houses versus this. And then what can we do together to make things better? And then on right. vulnerability, for sure, you know, do we have an adequate plan for um, the mobile homes here, even in the Hudson Valley? You yeah. Know, I think the figure here in Cold Spring, Phillipstown, which is the town, is a 25% poverty rate, which is low, you know, compared to many parts of the country. But there are mobile home communities here that are no one ever sees except maybe at the supermarket. What are we doing to check with them to see that, that how we can make their lives better as well? So, so community up to me is very valuable. And then finding a way to do the community to community part, to use the internet and, and these other tools to, uh, to make sure we're all learning with some agility and sharing information mm. uh, is all part of it too. Thank you and, so and much. One last that. thing. And there yeah. are students like, um, there's a, I think he's a senior, Silas. Oh my God, I can't remember his name, last name. I can never remember Silas's last name. He's from the Adirondacks. It, in high school, he was hired essentially by his town up there to do their climate audit. Wow. He was into it, and, you know, <laughs> and- That's now, incredible. Yeah, he, uh, he helped organize the, the last several climate summits, youth climate summits. And now he's teaching how to, other youth, how to hold the youth climate summit you know, in, at the high school level around New York City. That's that's great. And, you know, if I can facilitate that in any small way, I feel like I've done my job for that week or that day. Yeah, absolutely. Passing it forward. I'm wondering, is there anything that we didn't get to in the last 45 minutes or so that you'd want to add? Otherwise, I'm just so grateful that you took the time and really appreciate the conversation. Well, I'd, I'd flip things around. What do you think I'm not doing? Or what, what do you feel <laughs> Columbia can do more of? Oh, that's a good question. I think I think Columbia is moving in the right direction with the way that it's trying to diversify not only science communicators, but also scientists themselves. I feel like one of the really core components of being able to connect communities and have ground up solutions has to do with putting people in spaces, including academia, that don't all look the same and don't all have the same background. And I think Columbia has work to do still in that regard with diversifying its community and supporting diverse voices, and that includes climate communicators. But I've seen some promising first steps. I think Keilani Acosta, Lauren Ritchie um, are individuals oh, yeah. I've had the opportunity to speak with. And to me, that's kind of like what the future of Columbia climate communication needs to look like. Um, and so the work that they're doing, I think, is really, really empowering and encouraging to me. Um, I feel like you sort of hit on one of the other key pieces, which is just continuing to encourage and empower younger student voices as well to get involved. I work in DC currently, and I think there can sometimes be this tension between um, you know young people who come to the city that really do wanna be enacting some level of change or have a vision of what that change should look like. And those younger voices often come up against this kind of structural institutional monolith that is DC politics and Columbia to me, and I think universities overall can be spaces to really give people the tools, young people in particular, the tools to challenge and break through some of the institutional problems we have in our political system. And climate communication is a part of that, I think, um, being able to tell people how to engage with one another, um, how to use language and use their voice to communicate effectively. I learned how to do a lot of that while I was at Columbia. And I think continuing to encourage young students to find their respective voices and then take that to kind of speak truth to power is a really important part of this. And I think an important part of trying to solve the climate crisis or at least better address it. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are the two that come to mind for me, but it is, it's constantly evolving. And I think creating spaces like the ones that you do with the Sustain What webinars are important too, because I can't say I read all the climate coverage that's in mainstream you know, news outlets. It can feel a little overwhelming and it's hard to know what to track, but being able to listen to a conversation or participate in a conversation, I think helps me connect a lot more. And so I think the more spaces like that that exist, the more other people start to feel connected too. Great. Well, I'm glad to, I'm glad it's got a use. Um, thanks a lot yeah. for uh, reaching out. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it.